Guys, to be or not to be is still the question. Hello, everybody, and welcome to part five of my introduction to philosophy. If you're here for the first time, I would encourage you to watch the preceding videos of this series. Every part builds on the previous ones, and if you're not watching them in the right order, you may get confused. For your convenience, I have created a playlist in which everything is properly organized. You can find the link in the description below. On my website, for every single topic of discussion, you'll find a list of suggested readings as well as my sources. Also, if you like what I'm doing here and wouldn't mind seeing other similar materials, please subscribe to my channel and allow its notifications. In this way, you'll get my videos as soon as I'm posting them. I remain deeply grateful for your time and interest. At the end of my last video, I said that so far we saw only the enchanting front yard on the estate of philosophy. It is now time to explore the main attraction, philosophy's capacious palace, in order to get a better idea about its layout, vastness, and eminence. A quick warning before anything else. To accurately define the structure and function of philosophy is a huge and daunting task. Nobody in his or her right mind would even think of covering such a massive territory in a few videos. That's because philosophers did not hesitate to examine concepts, worldviews, beliefs, or theories drawn from religion, science, morality, politics, and art. Basically, throughout its long and venerable history, there is no aspect of human existence that philosophy hasn't cataloged, reflected upon, and often analyzed in incredible detail and with very complex results. So, one searches in vain for a scientific field or humanities discipline that doesn't have an entire body of philosophical reflection attached to it. In social sciences, for instance, we have philosophical psychology, philosophical anthropology, and philosophical sociology. Within humanities, I would mention philosophy of religion, philosophy of history, philosophy of education, philosophy of law, philosophy of literature, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of language. On the other hand, we have philosophy of science in general, as well as philosophy of mathematics, logic, economics, ecology, and biology. All of these are highly established disciplines with vast bibliographies. Even at the level of scholarship, very few people in the world today can claim full mastery of any one of them. That being said, how do I plan to deal with this issue here? As always, my approach will be very modest. I will seek to define philosophy by very briefly describing its traditional subfields. More exactly, I will try to introduce you to the key questions, issues, and problems of five different disciplines of philosophy, which are metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and political philosophy. Due to the nature and goals of this introductory series, I deliberately leave aside many other expressions of philosophy. Please keep in mind that every discipline not discussed here remains indispensable to any attempt to get a decent hold on this strange and awesome thing called philosophy. Regardless, my deepest hope is that you'll find at least one of the five disciplines I discuss intriguing enough to become genuinely interested in it, to study it in much greater depth, and one day, why not, to expand its frontiers by your own substantial contributions. So let's finally enter the great citadel of philosophy and take a brief glance at one of its oldest and biggest rooms, metaphysics. To keep things relatively manageable, I would say that metaphysics is the study of three separate yet closely related subjects. The first subject of metaphysics is seemingly the easiest, but as I will suggest below, it is in actual fact the most difficult. I'm speaking about metaphysics understood as the study of being as such. 
This is what specialists call ontology. What is ontology? It is that philosophical discipline which asks and tries to answer the question, what is being in its most generic sense? Or, what exactly do we mean when we say something or someone is? At first sight, this seems a ridiculously trivial question. After all, don't we all use some tense of the verb to be almost every time we open our mouth? I am, I was, I have been, or I will be, with all other variants for different pronouns, are probably the most recurrent words in any human language. Well, you might say, given this overwhelming use, we must surely know what being means. And yet, if I am to be a bit obnoxious and ask you, what exactly do you mean when you say you are, very difficult problems start to arise. Let's take one very basic example. You could say being means being present. By I am, you mean I am in this particular place at this particular time. Fair enough. But, I could reply, what about those cases where being does not necessarily imply presence? So, for example, when saying I have been there two years ago, what you're implying is that you are not there anymore. In this case, then, being refers to both something present and something absent, to both being and non-being, which is a contradiction. I'll just state that metaphysics tries to find a way out of such logical contradictions by attempting to explain being by means of various entities that make up the world. For example, objects, properties, numbers, substances, attributes, events, processes, and so on. I won't insist any further because in ontology things tend to get frustratingly complicated and off-putting very, very quickly. Despite its crucial importance, ontology is a highly specialized discipline which involves an esoteric jargon and a mind-boggling abstractness. And given my overall intentions, it will be nearly impossible to be faithful to the complex nature of ontology and to still spark your interest in metaphysics. However, those of you who would like to know more about this particular field may find some help in the orienting bibliography I have listed on my website. If you're disappointed in metaphysics' focus on being, you may be relieved to find out that metaphysics is equally concerned about the ultimate nature of all things. By ultimate nature, Metaphysicians mean first causes or first principles. This is the second form of metaphysics. Its key questions are a. How did anything come to exist and what is everything made of? b. Is there a God, that is to say, an ultimate cause of everything, and if so, what can we say about him or her? c. Is there any relation between this supposed deity and the world? Should we understand the world only in relation to this deity, or solely on its own? And if we are to explain the world only on its own terms, what are its most basic and absolutely irreducible constituents? In short, in its second form, metaphysics inquires into the origins and essential structure of existence. One of the most obvious and immediate answers to this inquiry would be that matter, or something material, is the very core of existence. This is the materialist position, but also the position adopted by most scientists today. Surprisingly enough, the first European philosophers, also known as the pre-Socratics, believed the same thing. Namely, that everything can be reduced to one or a combination of the four elements – water, air, fire, and earth. As to the origins of matter itself, these thinkers claim that there are none. Matter for them was eternal. So, 
unlike contemporary astrophysicists, they insisted that matter has not come into existence at some point in the distant past. Rather, matter has always been there. Other philosophers assume that a spiritual or transcendent entity is the first cause or principle of everything that exists, being small or large, visible or invisible, known or unknown to us. These were essentially religious thinkers. They assumed that one or more divine beings either have brought order into some kind of original pre-existing chaos, or have created everything out of nothing and keep sustaining it. Let me illustrate the spiritualist view by a few examples. The ancient philosopher Plato believed that a divine being called the Demiurge has turned the primordial material chaos into the ordered cosmos that we see when we look up at the sky. Plato's pupil, Aristotle, thought that matter is fundamentally eternal and that something called the prime unmoved mover holds everything in place and puts it in order. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the classical creationist models. These come in two flavors, so to speak. Monotheistic, as in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and polytheistic, as in Hinduism. In general, creationist metaphysics assumes that everything has been brought into existence out of nothing by a more or less all-powerful divine being. Second, what the deity has brought into existence is an ordered creation. Third, the creator continues to sustain creation for as long as he or she wishes. Thus, according to the creationist worldview, if the divine were ever to withdraw its support of the world, everything would simply vanish into the nothingness it came from. Here, I'd like you to remember that the etymological meaning of the word metaphysics is very important in the present context. Briefly, metaphysics is an ancient Greek word which can be defined as that which lies beyond the physical world. And as the realm of spirit is usually seen as residing somehow beyond the realm of material objects, metaphysics has become, over time, almost indistinguishable from religion. Now, I think you should know that this proximity with spirituality has eventually led to the demise of religious metaphysics in philosophical circles. The reason for that is the advent and development of science in modern times. Indeed, for the past century or so, science seems to have debunked all creationist myths regarding the origins of the universe. Instead, contemporary cosmologists claim to have found several explanations of the origins of the universe, which have absolutely nothing to do with God or any other metaphysical entity. Yet, I can help myself and observe, in passing, that contemporary scientists may have abandoned God, but did not abandon, entirely, the pursuit of final causes or principles. You may be surprised to find out that there are scientists who, despite vigorously rejecting the label metaphysician, are still engaged in a metaphysical practice of sorts. What do I mean by that? Let's start with the Big Bang Theory. This theory conjectures that our universe began as a result of an original explosion, when all matter was concentrated or crammed in an infinitely dense space. Now, many Big Bang theorists exclude any divine contribution to the coming into existence of the universe. Others disagree and suspect that this explanation is not necessarily incompatible with the belief in a transcendent creator. Be that as it may, it is the case that the Big Bang Theory made possible many scientifically respectable discussions about the beginnings of the universe. For some, as I just said, it even revived the creationist hypothesis. In my eyes, that's not very different from pursuing the ancient metaphysical dream 
of discovering the origins of everything that is. The second example is subatomic physics, a prominent branch of contemporary physics which seeks to identify and experimentally confirm the smallest constituents of the universe. More exactly, those fundamental particles that constitute all matter. So far, physicists have identified three such classes of particles – quarks, leptons, and neutrinos. Other physicists go even further and argue that something called strings is what everything is made of, from quarks to galaxies. However, there's absolutely no evidence that strings exist. Nobody has ever seen one. Indeed, we may never confirm their existence through measure and experiments. And yet, many brilliant minds continue to speculate about their existence and make lucrative careers in the meantime. Well, isn't the search for such ultimate building blocks of matter an unexpected reincarnation of metaphysics, understood as the pursuit of first principles and causes? And if this is still not very convincing, what about genetics? Isn't genetics engaged in uncovering the most basic building blocks of life itself, from amoeba to humans, going through plants and the entire animal realm? Philosophically speaking, what are cells, molecules, proteins, genes, or DNA? Would it be completely wrong to see all of them as versions of life's first causes? What I mean to draw your attention to through these examples is the continued relevance of metaphysical endeavors. Despite their explicit opposition to all metaphysics, some of the most groundbreaking scientific discoveries and innovative theories of our time end up reintroducing the metaphysical into the physical in interesting and unexpected ways. I guess even the history of science doesn't lack a certain sense of irony. At this point, I want to move to the third and final definition of metaphysics. The first two definitions identify metaphysics with the study of being as such and the study of ultimate causes. The third definition states that metaphysics is the study of reality. Here, the key question is, what is real and why? Conversely, What's the basis for considering something less real or unreal? You may be tempted to say that here, at least, the answer is very simple. After all, anybody can look around them and tell exactly what's real and what's fictional. One can certainly say that real is our concrete everyday experience. Real is what I sense in this place and at this very moment. Real is whatever my perceptions convey about the world around me. Obviously, this is one possible answer. But as always, philosophy prefers to go deeper and not needlessly so. And that's because the question, what is real, could accept other, equally plausible explanations. Let's elaborate a few. If you ask a medical doctor what is real, their answer would be, the myriad physiological processes that keep our bodies alive and more or less functioning. A perfect example would be digestion. No matter what you consciously perceive, feel, think or do, you're never aware, not even for a split second, of the unbelievably intricate way in which what you ate is turning to bodily nurture, energy and refuse. Digestion happens both automatically and behind closed doors. It remains completely outside any human awareness and control. Therefore, such a basic process could be seen as much more real than whatever thought or sensation seems to be passing through your head at any moment in time. If you pose the same question to a neuroscientist, they may reply that the most real aspect of human existence is our brain activity. Absolutely everything of importance, they would say, happens in the brain through its endless neural connections and chemical processes. Cerebral activity is what makes human experience possible, and so what generates reality. 
Precisely because it is more basic than our conscious life, the neuroscientists may argue, brain activities are more real than anything else. To quote a famous character from a famous movie, if real is what you can feel, smell, taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. But how would a psychologist or psychotherapist react to our question? I think that they would agree with the neuroscientist that the brain plays a huge role in one's perception of reality. However, they would insist on the primacy of the mind or the psyche over any bodily organ, the brain included. They would say that real is our consciousness, broadly understood, and our emotional state. And if they happen to agree with the psychoanalytical theory of Sigmund Freud, they would qualify that statement by saying that most real in the life of the human mind is the unconscious, that deeper, inaccessible realm of the psyche which contains repressed traumatic memories or secret immoral desires. Now, if we turn to a Hindu or Buddhist teacher, they would tell us that what neuroscientists, psychologists, and even cosmologists say about reality is Maya, a vast and irresistible illusion meant to keep us trapped within samsara, that is, the cycle of birth and rebirth. The Hindu teacher would add that the true reality is Atman, the spiritual essence or principle of the universe. Their Buddhist counterpart would disagree on this particular point and say that only nirvana, that is, the state of absolute selflessness and complete detachment from the world, can claim the title of ultimate reality. But both teachers would agree that everything about the physical world, as well as the content of immediate human experience, is at bottom unreal. What about the monotheist believer, be they Hebrew, Christian, or Muslim? For their part, they would insist that this world is the creation of the one absolute God, who is supremely real. At the same time, they would say, what we usually call reality is only relatively real. And they would probably add that, for us humans, life after death is always more real and blessed than this world with its transience, sufferings, and sins. So, what are we to make of all this? Who's right and who's wrong? Do we have to choose only one answer from all of the above? Can we somehow combine all of them without running into new, greater, and even insurmountable problems? I have no idea. What I do know is that for two millennia, metaphysics has offered multiple, original, fascinating, and quite credible answers to the question concerning reality. We wouldn't risk much in saying that, until mid-19th century, no major philosopher could really avoid confronting the enigma of reality. At the same time, we shouldn't forget that, no matter how profound, all solutions to the problem of reality have proven not just brilliant, but also open to criticisms. Not just consistent with what we know, but also incomplete. Not just impossible to ignore, but also in constant need of improvement. Allow me to give you just one example, so that you will get a taste of what I'm talking about. In the Western civilization, one of the most well-known metaphysical systems belongs to the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. As a metaphysician, Plato argues that the external world with which we come into contact every instant of our waking life is a mere shadow or imperfect image of the perfect world of forms or ideas. For Plato, the beautiful things we encounter in everyday life are just a pale copy of the idea of beauty itself. The same can be said about just laws, which can only approximate the idea of justice. Similarly, good thoughts and deeds are just inferior embodiments of goodness itself. Secondly, according to Plato, each and every form exists in a separate, eternal, and unchanging world, which is fully independent from ours. We humans can access the absolute world of ideas because we have an immortal soul. However, as long as our soul lives in a human body, 
we can get only brief and temporary glimpses of eternal ideas. The even worse news is that most of us are excluded from this privilege. That's because for Plato, solely philosophers, that is, those who pursue the contemplative life of rational reflection and existential detachment from this world, become aware of the eternal forms. In short, only philosophers come to the realization that only eternal ideas are truly real. Plato's is just one classical answer to the metaphysical question of reality. There are many, many others. Some belong to the other giant of Greek thought, Aristotle. Others come from medieval times and are deeply intertwined with the three monotheistic traditions. Here we can mention the metaphysical systems of Maimonides in Judaism, of Averroes and Avicenna in Islam, and of Augustine, Dan Scotus, and Thomas Aquinas in Christianity. Modern philosophy also abounds in metaphysical concerns and solutions. I would remind in this sense the metaphysics of Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that metaphysics is, in one form or another, everywhere. Still, so far we mentioned only a small part of our culture, namely a few famous philosophers and some fancy scientific theories. What about the rest of us? What will metaphysics do for those of us who won't leave any mark in the history of philosophy? Why should we, and indeed anybody, care about it? A perfectly legitimate question. And here's my tentative answer. The problem of what's real and what's not has several tremendous implications for everyone. Let me explain. If metaphysics is, at least in part, inseparable from religion, and you believe in a divine being, then metaphysics is, I would dare say, your second nature. Why? Well, remember that every religious faith, regardless of its theology, determines the way every believer behaves in his or her private existence family, and community. Religion influences one's political decisions, as well as things like erotic relations, family life, and social ethics. Therefore, spiritual commitment is just one way in which metaphysics could dominate one's personal existence. If we move from the personal to the collective, the importance of religious metaphysics becomes even more clear. In this regard, I would just mention that, according to some statistics, only 7% of the world's population is declaredly non-religious. Which basically means that no less than 93% of the world's population lives in conformity with some kind of metaphysical worldview. But what if you are non-religious? Does that mean that metaphysics will never concern you? I wouldn't rush to answer yes. As we've seen, highly influential atheists like contemporary scientists are not completely foreign to metaphysics. Should you think that given their tiny number, their example is irrelevant, I'd point your attention to popular culture, especially movies. Why movies? Because movies show our deepest desires, fears, concerns, and hopes on a mass scale. And interestingly enough, the question of reality lies at the center of such blockbusters as The Matrix Trilogy, Inception, and The Truman Show to give just three examples amongst many. The existence of a hidden world behind a visible one is the metaphysical postulate of the Harry Potter franchise. I would add that classics like Star Wars and The Lord of the Rings portray existence as a battleground between forces of good and evil both of which have an essentially spiritual and so a metaphysical character. Do I need to say anything about the superhero movies? Batman, Spider-Man, Superman? And so on and so forth. The success of such movies cannot but confirm that popular culture, although not explicitly religious, is either a hidden metaphysician or a secret lover of metaphysics. I hope this provides enough food for thought regarding the fact that something as seemingly alien or insignificant as metaphysics, understood as theory of ultimate realities, deeply pervades existence, yours, mine, and everybody else's.
Now, even if I manage to convince you that metaphysics is worth knowing more about, there is another set of questions which immediately arises. It is this. Admitting that the question of reality is fundamental, is humanity really capable of knowing with infallible certainty what's actually real? Or is the question of reality utterly unanswerable, forever out of our cognitive reach? And let's admit for a second that we are capable. But then what are the criteria and human faculties that would allow us to discern between what's real and what's not? Should we trust our reason only? Or should we place our bets on sensorial experience? Perhaps distrusting, like all committed materialists, everything that cannot be put to test and confirmed through experiment. Although somewhat metaphysical, these particular questions belong to another important branch of philosophy, namely the theory of knowledge or epistemology. This will be the subject of our next encounter. I hope to see you soon. Until then, thanks so much for watching and try not to avoid or despise metaphysics. It's part of who you are, while its heroes need and fully deserve your appreciation.